question. My name is Jocelyn Broman. I am a We the People alumni. Uh, I competed back in 2006. I currently work on Capitol Hill for Representative Paul Cook of California. And I'm Francine Engel. I'm a judge from Maryland. I'm a political scientist and um, a constitutional scholar. Um, I uh, work with Maryland for civic and education and am a lecturer at University of Maryland. And I'm Mike Miles from Birmingham, Alabama, and I just wish I was as smart as the two of them, but I'm going to run to keep up. We're going to do all right. Um, my name is Jay Knight, and I'm a junior at Greenwich High School. My name, uh, my name is Mark Chen, and I'm a junior at Greenwich High School. My name is Sheldon Fala, and I'm a junior at Greenwich High School. And my name is Danny Spitz, and I'm also a junior at Greenwich High School. And these are our coaches, Coach Aaron Hull, Coach Peggy Moore, and Coach Andrew Maloney. Excellent. Thank you all for joining with us today. Uh, so I will go ahead and read the question, and then you'll be able to begin your statement. Question three, Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution provides that state legislatures can determine the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives, yet gives Congress the power to make or alter such regulations. What are the advantages and disadvantages of a uniform election process? What responsibility do state legislatures, state election officials, and citizens have in maintaining free and fair elections? What are the advantages and disadvantages of the trustee and delegate, delegate theories of representation as they apply to congressional districts? You may begin when ready. In a speech on the right of suffrage, James Madison noted that the right of suffrage is a fundamental article in Republican constitutions. The regulation of it is at the same time a task of peculiar delicacy. As it stands, elections in America are primarily regulated by state legislatures. This is because Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1 of the Constitution delegates this power to state legislatures, although Congress has the power to make or alter such regulations. However, there are limited pieces of federal legislation regulating voting across the country, and the broad nature of those laws allow for a great deal of interpretation and therefore variance at the state and local level. In a uniform election process, every aspect of the election is consistent throughout the country. In this process, all states would be required to use the same voting equipment, identification regulations, and procedures when creating voting districts. So the advantages to this are clear. Every voter would be treated equally and the uniformity across the nation would allow for free and fair elections. The most challenging aspect of a uniform election process would be transitioning from our current process, but if executed properly, there would be no lasting disadvantages. To ensure success, the entire process must be comprehensively tested for security and also must be reasonably scalable so that similar measures can be adopted by both small towns and big cities. The trustee model of representation was implemented to provide politicians with the basis of discretion over policy and legislation, even though their decisions may not always coincide with the preferences of their constituents. In Federalist Paper 46, Madison suggests that the U.S. government should function as a trustee of the people. The main justification given by Madison for the trustee model is that it facilitates deliberative democracy, with the implication being that deliberation has better results. This can lead to complications when representatives are tempted to act in their own self-interest, perhaps to seek a donation from a large corporation instead of that of the people. The defining distinction between the trustee and delegate model is that while a trustee balances the interests of their constituents and the country using their personal judgment, a delegate serves as a mere mouthpiece to the voice, of the, voice and views of their constituents. However, the delegate model risks the prioritization of local issues over national ones, which can lead to inefficient pork barrel spending. The trustee model in its purest form, uninfluenced by national or local partisanism, and given the knowledgeable representative, is the best model of representation. With that being said, when it comes to maintaining free, fair, and frequent elections, there are many more factors than whether or not candidates are trustees or delegates. The practice of gerrymandering, which has been in place since the early 1800s, has undermined this duty to maintain free and fair elections. Unfortunately, gerrymandering is fueled by a trustee model of representation. Trustees, although more efficient when a large country needs to work together on national issues, tend to be more independent in their motivations, meaning they can often act in their own self-interest. In reality, this translates to heightened partisanship, with trustees voting with their own party. This ultimately fuels state legislatures to engage in partisan gerrymandering and voter suppression tactics. Gomillion v. Lightfoot in 1960 was one of the earliest Supreme Court cases where the court struck down a gerrymandered district. In Shaw v. Reno, North Carolina gerrymandered a district to the point that in some cases it was only as wide as a single roadway. 
However, these were both ruled unconstitutional because they were clearly racial gerrymanders. In the 2019 case, Rucho v. Common Cause, the court claimed they are unable to interfere in partisan gerrymandering cases. Considering that virtually all gerrymandered districts are strictly partisan, this was a major setback to those wishing to reform gerrymandering. Nevertheless, under Arizona State Legislature v. Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, the Supreme Court held that a legislature may delegate its authority under the Elections Clause to other entities. Several states, such as Arizona, California, and New, New Jersey, have already elected to transfer their power of drawing congressional district lines from their respective legislatures to independent redistricting commissions. If the United States were to adopt a uniform election process, states could rely on independent or bipartisan redistricting commissions to unbiasedly redraw congressional lines based on population shifts. Thank you. We are now open to questions. Morning. So, I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm sorry. Uh, so, what do we do with? You mentioned that partisan gerrymandering is not something that can be is has been ruled unjusticiable by the Supreme Court. Is it? actually a problem or isn't it a good idea to have incumbency and those kinds of issues as a isn't it a good idea to have people have representation through party in congress is partisan gerrymandering actually an issue oh as is the precedent under baker v carr which is of course the defining document or the defining case which rules gerrymandering as a judiciable issue we look at partisanism in a different light. Partisanism in itself represents the views of the people who subscribe to those political ideologies. However, heightens in part, heightened partisanism, which can be caused by gerrymandering, often leads to more extremities in terms of political candidates. Political candidates on the right and the left can both be more extreme in their views if they are able to artificially manufacture voting districts, whereas a more centrist candidate might garner more bipartisan support in districts which are purely gerrymandered on a partisan basis, extremes on both the political right and left can be a big problem. Yeah, it is also important to note that in districts that are partisanly gerrymandered, um, it's not that all residents and all registered voters in that district agree uh, with the majority party. In many cases, uh, these districts are gerrymandered to be advantageous uh, to the party that has gerrymandered them. So that is putting uh, the most amount of people in that district that would allow uh, the party that has gerrymandered that district to win. Francine, the, I'm gonna follow up to her, if you don't mind, and ask about the independent commission. We toss the phrase should be drawn by an independent commission around. A commission is only as independent as who it is that appointed them. Who should be on, how should an independent commission be chosen? to take on the task of putting some people out of politics, putting some people out of office, and continuing some people in it. If you were appointing an independent commission to draw the districts in Connecticut, who would you put on it? Um, yes, I, I think it should be people who have uh, no stake in the outcome of the election. Um, and it, it is hard, you're right, it's very hard to find a group of people that are independent, freely thinking, so we also said that uh, bipartisan commissions would work as well. Um, if you have the same amount of people from each party uh, and you force them to come to an agreement on the most fair district, uh, that would also help a lot with gerrymandering. What is a most fair district? What are the qualifications that you're thinking of? Um, we, we want uh, the districts to be purely redrawn based on population shifts. Uh, and just to um, try to make each district be as equal in population as possible uh, while not taking the parties of uh, the constituents of the districts into account. So what things should they take into account when they are redrawing the lines? Um, they have to try to come up with some kind of draw the line some way. Should it just be completely random or should they try to keep certain interests um, represented so that their ideas can be represented? What, what should they be thinking about? Um, I believe that they should just think about purely population shifts. Um, population shifts uh, is the most, that's the only reason that we should redraw the district is to make sure that every vote counts the same. Uh, there's the same amount of people in every district. I don't think, once you start looking into other aspects of uh, 
voters, then uh, a lot of bias can come into play. Yeah, and like it, my partner it, said, that we definitely should just base look based solely on population shifts and not generally on other factors that contribute to it, such as socioeconomic race and anything that will dilute the minority vote, for example. There was a policy stating one man, one vote, and that is really important to consider, especially when racially gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering, any gerrymandering cases, because we always want to have one man, one vote. In addition to population shifts, it's important to avoid inconsistencies in border lines. It's important to avoid packing where, of course, you pack small groups of people with the same political ideology into one district. And in addition, as my partner mentioned, racial gerrymandering, this is something that has been clearly spoken out against in the case of Shaw v. Reno, in which you have a district which is only as wide as a single roadway in some cases. And in addition, in the case of Arizona, the Intertribal Commission, you see that the, the government does maintain the authority under the Supremacy Clause to rule and to make and alter these regulations as it sees fit. And while Congress has, and while the Supreme Court has continued to avoid this political thicket, it's important that we note that Congress has overtly spoken out against racial gerrymandering. And in cases of injustice, Congress does maintain the power to overrule these states. Yeah, just like my colleague said, in the 2019 case, Ruch should be common cause the court did claim they are unable to intervene in partisan gerrymandering cases. Um, are there any groups that you feel are still disenfranchised? Yes, I believe so. I think that in, in, a, in a statement Trump recently made, uh, President Trump recently made, he said that if the primary voting systems became more mail-in um, and absentee ballots took over in this uncertain time with the whole COVID-19 characteristic. He said that Republicans would never win another major election. And of course, the implication of this is that with the recent shift in voter ID laws and things of the sort, it seems that President Trump is trying to disenfranchise people to garner districts and, and voting populations, which are more beneficial to his party. And that's time, guys. Very nice job. You, you got, we, we kind of got stuck on one issue, but it was a really good discussion, guys. It was fantastic. You, you all did a very, you did a great job of just taking what we were saying and just sticking to what you were, mm -hmm. what your argument was, and you did a good job of defending it as well. However, I'm going to give you an opposite little perspective that if sometimes, if you do just based on population, you may lose out on having minority majority districts, which could restrict representation of different social, of different socioeconomic and racial ideas in Congress and in state legislatures. That's why population isn't only the way, only the uh, qualification for doing redistricting, that they also consider contiguousness, how close things are, that neighborhoods are together, that um, they consider whether incumbency is important because also if you're also doing it only by population, you could put a lot of incumbents in jeopardy. That may be a good thing, but that also means that you might not have that seniority in Congress to accomplish certain things. So it's one of those things that this is, you guys, again, you did a great job defending and pushing back when we're like, but what about this? But what about this? But there are those other qualifications to consider. So just keep that in mind as you're moving forward in life as well, that sometimes one criteria just doesn't actually solve the entire problem. Now, if we're in a place like, for example, um, Iowa is pretty um, homogeneous, generally speaking, and they use an independent redistricting commission, and it tends to look like four squares. So sometimes that works really well, and some of those districts have become competitive in recent years in Congress. They've switched from red to blue, and so you have that question as well. So there's some portion, portion of that, but also continue to think about there's also a broader perspective, but otherwise... Your statement was wonderful. I loved how you hit it and talked about Madison. Um, your trustee and delegate discussion was very good as well. So I just want to commend you on a great presentation and thank you for letting us participate in it as well. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. Um, I really enjoyed your constitutional application. 
um, both in your presentation and in the follow-up. Um, you did a really good job bringing up cases. Um, I really enjoyed how you brought in Federalist number 46 as you were talking about um, the trustee theory and you used my favorite uh, phrase, deliberative democracy, which I think is so uh, uh, important. Um, and you know, you really did an excellent job talking about uh, gerrymandering. It's sort of a topic that we've been wanting to talk about uh, a lot today and not no one's really brought it up too much. So <laughs> we're really excited to be able to have the chance to uh, discuss gerrymandering uh, with you today. So thank you very much. You did a great job. Yeah, I agree. This was uh, getting on it and staying on it. We've been frustrated at not getting to get on this and really delve into it. And you gave us the chance to do that today. You really did. I also love some of the phrases you used. I'll just mention one. Jocelyn, I know you love this one inefficient pork barrel spending. I never have seen efficient pork barrel spending unless it was coming unless it was coming to my district. I've never that's called word up, but that's not really pork barrel barrel spending anymore. <laughs> we got Robert Bird used to say that to some people it was pork barrel spending. To him it was special project money for the good people of West Virginia. So it's I, always special project money. Always. Always. Always special project money. That's right. This Aaron, this was fun. This was uh we've been uh in awe of the job the, 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 for the teachers to do this every year in the normal sequence of things is pretty amazing. But for y'all to have been able to do this this year with this degree of difficulty factored in makes us appreciate them and makes us appreciate you even more. Thank you very much. Well, well thank you. And in, in terms of pork barrel, it, pork barrel is everybody else, but it, doesn't bacon make everything better? That's right. Bacon makes everything better. <laughs> At least breakfast anyway, I guarantee you. <laughs> Y'all do 